Dermot and Dave's Peaky Blinders special exclusive interview with Killian Murphy on Today FM. Killian, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm admiring your beard. <laughs> Thank you. It's, Thank you. Uh, is this just I'm letting myself go, or is it uh, for a role? Well, it's it's yeah, it's professionally letting myself go. <laughs> uh, well, being yeah, being asked to do that. Yeah, I'm I'm doing a film called A Quiet Place Two. Tell us about that one. A Quiet Place was um, it's a, I guess it's a sort of a it's a horror film directed by John Krasinski uh, with Emily Blunt, and I saw it in the cinema last year. I brought my kids to see it, and I thought it was amazing because the whole setup of it is that the aliens that are have taken over the planet they're blind but they have this extraordinary uh, ability to hear so nobody can speak or make a loud noise so the whole film is effectively a silent film and what he does is he amps up the tension and the jeopardy and it's terrifying but brilliant and it's also kind of about family because mm. there's this little family unit trying to exist but not uh, being able to communicate vocally and they have a daughter who's deaf so they have they all sign it's a brilliant film really emotional and scary so we're doing we're doing there's the sequel of that but isn't that every parent's nightmare just trying to keep your kids quiet under yeah. under pressure of I know, death i know <laughs> <laughs> and they still won't yeah be what quiet. what something's killing me i just think it's really unrealistic because they would be like what do you mean something's trying to kill me what uh but the first one was such a massive hit yeah I, it really was um and i think because it was so original i mean it still ticks all the boxes of that yeah you know the, the what you'd expect from a sort of a blockbuster you know a sort of alien apocalypse thing but in a really original way yeah, uh, like people were terrified to eat their popcorn in the cinema because it was you were so invested in the story and not making a sound. Isn't that brilliant though? Yeah, the content of the movie comes in and infiltrates the crowd. Yeah, and I not since Rocky Four in the <laughs> cinema in Limerick have I heard that where people people were literally throwing their lit cigarettes in the air and. <laughs> Why Rocky? Uh, are you able to tell us anything about your character in it, or is no. it top secret? Yeah, I mean, just I'm, that he has a beard. He has, he has. That's a major spoiler. But um, <laughs> no, the, uh, well, I'm, I'm really anti spoilers. I mean, the, the clues in the word, right? It spoils, yeah. it. and and um, I think people are obsessed now with finding information before the fact, but. It, it, the beauty of it is going in and not knowing. I mean, you all, if you've seen the first one, you kind of know the setup now. Yeah. Um, but no, I just love it when you go and you don't know anything about it and um, you're totally open to it. You know? How did you find going with the beard and the skin crawling <laughs> sca- stage that you have to go through when you grow these? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely, simple pleasure not shaving in the morning, isn't it? it just you kind of... You just go, ugh, don't have to do that. Um, and plus it's for work. It, so if your missus goes, I hate that thing, shave it off. You're like, sorry. Sorry, can't do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an alarming variety of colors. Uh, but that, that's a new development. Uh, it, it's only a few colors. Uh, yeah. It's not like you just ate a bag of Skittles in, in, <laughs> no. in the hot sunshine. <laughs> anyway... Well, let's talk about your more clean-shaven roles and more namely Peaky Blinders, which yeah. is absolutely brilliant. Nice one. Uh, I feel honoured to sit down and talk to you about it because it, it is such a big television event mm. and people are rightly obsessed with it and in particular your character, Thomas Shelby. So what can you tell us about how his character develops in the next season, which we're all dying to see? Well... At the end of season four, he was in a pretty fragile state, I think, uh, you know, emotionally and psychologically. Um, oh, like always there's this sort of duality with Tommy where like materially, you know, he's got everything he could poss- possibly wish for. Mm. He, he'd just become elected as an, as an MP. He was made OBE. Um, but I think it's the classic thing of, you know... Uh, 
Well, you can look at the character in two ways. I always find it e- easier to do it this way. You can look at the character pre the First World War and post the First World War. And people talk about him sort of retrospectively about him being, you know, uh, he wanted to work with horses and he laughed a lot. And and we saw in series four that he was actually uh, a member of the a Communist Party. Yeah. Him, and and uh, that he... Um, he was very, very idealistic and all of that. And uh, but then that the experiences of France and the trenches, and he was a tunneler in the First World War, which is like they used to call them clay kickers. It's the worst possible job you could possibly have, mm. tunneling underneath German trenches or parallel to German trenches in this, these tiny spaces, and then sometimes breaking through into the German trenches and having hand to hand combat with the and then the tunnels collapsing on top of them and and then he come gets spat back into society in uh, nineteen eighteen or whatever it was and um has never dealt with uh, uh, what happened to him you know and so mm-hmm. that is what we now call PTSD what they called shell shock but even then it was there was it wasn't really no one sort of recognized it as a as an illness or a condition. So basically I think all of that is coming back to roost now. Yeah. And he's been sort of medicating. In the beginning, he was medicating with opium, and then he was medicating with like booze and. In fairness, ambition. everybody self medicates in, well, in Peaky Blinders. That, that's true because, I, and I suppose for the men, certainly there is no set set of symptoms for PTSD. Do you know, it can manifest in a myriad of ways, a myriad yeah. of generally sort of negative ways. Violence was a sort of a form of expression back then. You know, a lot of these men brought home their weapons as well from the First World War and the stuff they'd seen. You know, they didn't speak about it. So it's all just um, bubbling beneath the surface. And t- Tommy manages miraculously to sort of turn it into this um, this sort of insatiable ambition, you know. Mm. Uh, um, and that keeps him going for a while. But inevitably, you know that it's going to come back and bite him. This trauma, it's basically a trauma yeah. that they've all suffered. Like a trauma beyond our imagining. And, and, and they've never, ever faced it you know what's it like coming back in after a break you know because they're quite lengthy breaks between yeah. seasons what's it like coming back in and picking up where you left off i mean i'm just trying to think from my point of view sometimes if you ha- you know if i haven't done an impression on stage for ages mm. and then i come back and try and do it yeah you realize that's that's not actually that's an impression of the impression yeah. i was doing <laughs> yeah a what's parody it, yeah, yeah so what's it like to come in and pick up a character like that if you haven't, presumably you haven't wanted to think about him for a while, then you've been playing other people in the meantime. So it's exactly what what you say. And um, every time I finish doing it, I go, I, I don't know if I could do that again. Or and then when I go back to try and get back into it, I, I've totally forgotten how I did it in the first place and can't conceive of how. I did it, you know. Um, how do you, do you have to watch back an episode and go, oh, yeah, that's um, how I... I might watch back the last episode of the last series to sort of remind myself of the world. Um, but it's a slow process of trying, you know, g- never sure if I'll get the accent back right. Will it be all right? And then go back and get it. Because you can't ever think, ah, I'll snap back into that. Yeah. Because... You know? It's a big old leap for me. It's just you know he's 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 not really like me in any way. So um, you just have to put in the hours and put in the effort. And you spend a lot of time talking with the director and talking with the writer, figuring out how the new uh, series is gonna go, and just putting in the time. Mm. Uh, yeah, you can never. I I certainly can't. I never have the confidence to go. Oh yeah, well I'll just turn up. I'll just rock up on Monday and it'll be fun. I get the haircut. It'll be grand. Can't, <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> yeah, give us a uh, blade one hour now and uh, take a toit, then we're started. Yeah. And suddenly the, the accent starts coming out. Oh, nice. Um, when you are doing the accent, yeah. do you ever have a take where it just doesn't come out right? Or, ah, yeah. or someone says to you, no, that actually sounded a bit Jamaican or something? Like. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, definitely, particularly at the beginning. And I'm not, I don't have the ability that you have, which is to just snap into an accent immediately. I can't, I need to work at it. And it, for me, it's like taking your mouth to the gym. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for a month, it takes about a month for me to get an, to figure an accent out. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a good mimic. 
Do you know? But I lick can, those lips. <laughs> I can <laughs> give me ten chin presses and a jaw squat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what it's like. Um, and like I say, every year I go, oh, I can't remember how that how I did that. But the thing that's always that's given me a bit of confidence over the years has always been that the people of Birmingham have been very forgiving to all of us. But that's the greatest compliment, isn't it? Exactly. Like, and so we've gotten away with it. Because Irish people are far harsher, I think, you know. And I think, yes, they are. And and it's a tricky accent, yeah. you know. Um, That's Carlo, not Kilkenny. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. And say to some American, you know. Yeah, and it, it's a really hard accent. And, it, 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 you know, I, I, I struggle um, if accents aren't, aren't done correctly. But then you have to realize you're not making it. You're making it for the whole world. Yeah. And you do the best you can. And as long as... The people of Birmingham have been really forgiving, so I feel like we've gotten away with it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and I think it's a, it's an impossible accent to to try. I it, certainly can't do it. Yeah, but I, and I think that there was a what it did with 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 Peaky. What it did was it sort of broke this sort of uh, cliche of the Bir- Birmingham accent, which, which you know people sp- it, it's really kind of lo- um, people speak really slowly and uh, so did that old voice yeah that sort of thing that came yeah, from but, television to, yeah and, and it's generally comic yeah and lugubrious like the Liverpool oh, I can't down you exactly. know they don't talk like that either the, nobody talks like that so yeah. people were so when you were like fellas talking really fast and um, with great sort of intellect it completely uh, just flipped it. The preconception you have of a, of a Birmingham accent because they'd never really been put on telly except mm. in a comic way. Do you know? Yeah. Let's talk about Steve Knight, the writer. Yes. Who is, obviously is exceptional. Yeah. And you wouldn't be doing it if he wasn't so good. Uh-huh. I didn't know actually that the inspiration from it came from his great uncles mm. who were essentially Peaky Blinders or certainly mm. of that ilk yeah and so that's what he drew down and obviously it isn't exactly historically accurate but yeah. um the fact that he's using all of those anecdotes that he would have heard around the dinner table when he was a small kid it really plays into the realism so what's the relationship between you and him now at this point in the whole series where you know uh, you must be working very closely together now or does he just hand you something and go read that it's a it's a kind of a mixture of both He's a genius writer. That yeah. kind of goes without saying. And the fact that he is from Birmingham, and as you say, like these stories were handed down to him. He said to me once, he, when he writes it, it's like like spring water. Do you know what I mean? It just it just pours out of him this the story and the inspiration for it, and um, and he's created this whole. I mean, they did exist, but very 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 little is known about the actual gang. I mean, I remember putting. Peaky Blinders into Google just before we started mm. making the series and there was like one hit. <laughs> um, so very people knew very little about it. So then he created this whole mythology really about about them and how they existed and how they went about. I think they, we did know that they were bookies, book ma- illegal bookmakers. Yeah, and all that stuff that we you know we see across the episodes of them down the the racetrack. Yes. All all that is is legit, and that's what they yeah, did. That's they how just they basically started. made a nuisance of themselves down there yeah. and extorted money out of whoever they could. Exactly. Yeah, and robbed anyone who they saw winning. That's it. And then it, and then the ambition grew and and grew and, I mean, in our story, it's gone to a whole other level obviously but what what i like about his writing is that he he manages to weave in a lot of political events like real political events into the story or the mythology of the the sort of peaky saga Mm. and in this series that's it's probably the most overtly he's ever done that uh because he's introduced um oswald mosley into the into the story as the kind of main antagonist that tommy has to deal with so this is a character we're, we're going to get to know now yeah. in season five. Exactly, yeah. Um, who's a real, real life politician? He was he was the leader of the the, the fascist movement in mm. Britain in the in the early thirties, the late twenties, early thirties. Um, so he does that really elegantly and brilliantly, um, and it's also kind of frightening uh, in in terms of holding up a mirror to what's going to happen today yeah. in politics you know one thing without giving too much away i i'm lucky enough to have seen the first episode of season five and some of my favorite moments are 
Thomas Shelby in Westminster. Oh, yeah. And mixing with people who clearly are looking down on him. Yeah. But as usual, you know, he's got the make of them all. Yeah. But seeing him in those corridors of power and realizing that he is just as, if not more powerful, because he's had to, he's had to work at it the hard yeah. way. Yeah, there's a brilliant quote in it um, where somebody asks Tommy, um, what's, what's politics like? And he says, gangs, wars and truces. Nothing I didn't already know. <laughs> and you yeah. know, it seems like so obvious that being the leader of a gang and having to deal with all of that, uh, which is in essence hier- hierarchical, uh, you know what I mean? Mm. But clearly not democratic. But if you just take all of the that what he's used about holding on to power uh, and then apply that to politics, you know, he's made for it. You know? yeah. And and um, turns out he's a very good orator as well. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is great to hear him standing up. Yeah. And, you know, because he's, he's he's not putting it on. He's just actually being himself. You know, yeah. One thing I like about it, obviously, in the in the last season, we saw a lot of strain on the family and the relationships, you know, and particularly between you and your brothers. And mm. In the new season, people are for, for different circumstances we can't get into, but you start to come back together a bit more. Yeah. And that strength of family is, is very much there. Um, and that just, I don't know, that made me feel really good. You yeah. know, that you're, you're starting to, to unite again. Yeah, well, that's kind of how there's, a, there's an incident that happens at the very beginning of episode one that um, they have no choice but to all to regroup. And they only work, I think, well together in the face of adversity. You know what I mean? They don't really, yeah. they don't really work well when things are going grand. No. As but soon they, as the time and money came yeah. in, that's when things start to break down yeah. and coke habits develop. And, all of that. Yeah. You know, all of that stuff. And it's, um, so, but, but, the, but the threat faced the threat that they're faced with this series is very different because um like like last year it was the ma- at the mafia right and that's that's a very tangible kind of obvious physical threat and you go right that's the Amer- american version of them yeah w- except on a much larger w- more more well organized scale but this year it's it's kind of economic and ideological the sort of and for tommy psychological the threats that they're faced with, which is a, a new development, mm. you know, for them. But he's definitely very much the boss. There's a great scene where Arthur, God love him, tries to chair a meeting. Oh, and yeah. He's just <laughs> uh, trying to be a poor, bumbling photocopy of what he thinks Tommy yeah. would say at that moment. And yeah. then in your character walks and everything is sorted. Yeah, you know? I think that's the that's the that's the dynamic, though, of those of every gangster piece is that um dynamic that tricky dynamic between uh being a criminal gang and trying to go legit you know what i mean so yeah. if arthur it's a, it's a very uncomfortable place to be in in that sort of legitimate business world uh, but tommy manages to kind of move between them quite seamlessly but a lot of them struggle with that oh now we've earned our fortune now we have to be legitimate and as i said they deal much better with threat and yeah um and violence really (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah particularly arthur that's where he's very much at home another thing that i love about the series is that the female characters even though the camera may not be on them as much as your character Mm -hmm. or a couple of the lads they're such powerful women Mm -hmm. they're strong characters they're strong women um and i know polly's story and we've we've followed quite a lot Mm -hmm. like I like that because it's probably more realistic and reflective of the time in that mm-hmm. all their men pissed off to the war. Yeah. Most of them didn't come back. Absolutely. And these were the literally the people who kept the country taken over. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly where we start at the beginning of the first series is the lads come back and the women have been running everything. Yeah. And, uh, and there's that sort of terrible... Uh, moment when they realize they've actually been doing a brilliant job <laughs> without yeah. them and, and, yeah. and the men it's the, the men have this whole sort of existential thing of like why what you know we, we're not needed here and then they have to sort of regain their sort of influence and status and all of that <clears throat> um but for tommy i think he's for tommy it's always about merit he's actually sort of gender blind is that a word or like he he doesn't care it's just like as long as the person is good at the job it's long as long as someone is trustworthy and 
um, good at what they do, then he's they're the right person for him. And you know, Polly is the person that he trusts most of all. Mm. I think she's the person that can read him better than anyone else. I think in this series you'll see that Lizzie. It becomes a real powerhouse and really um, challenges that sort of uh, Tommy's leadership and Tommy's... Um, I think she's very strongly about, look, we've made a fortune. Look where we live. You're now an MP. Let's enjoy it. Whereas Tommy's too relentless. He can't, he can't stop. And I think there's a real tension between Lizzie, uh, who is a brilliant character, who, you know, who they have a relationship going all the way back uh, Tommy and Lizzie, and she does. She 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 uh, stands up to him brilliantly. Mm. So yeah, it, it it's it's, it's not a, unusual compared to, you know, modern billionaires. You know, people go, why don't you just sit in an island and you know spend your money? You yeah, know, they can't. Zuckerberg is making his own money now. Yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> he's yeah. he's sick of spending the stuff we have. He wants to make his own currency. You know, so yeah. it's that those people who are who are driven, whether fictional or, or real, that's that's part of their character. Traits. That is true, but also um, the the thing that you begin to see in this series as well is that it's also very very successful, intelligent men at a certain age, <laughs> which is early forties, mid forties, mm. began to have the, have that crisis, and it's not just the mi- you know middle age thing, but it's also like. What am I? I've achieved mm. everything. So how are you in middle age? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for your 40s. Yeah. Because people seem to, I think the middle age seems to get stretched higher and higher into the, you know, somebody in their mid-60s. Well, I'm middle aged now. Well, yeah, well, it's kind of yeah. accurate though, isn't it? Where are you, do you think? Oh, I don't know. I mean... I, I I'm okay. I think you know. I I've I've. Uh, it's not being that thing where like you kind of you're like a cartoon character. You run off the edge of a cliff and you keep on running and then you look down. It hasn't been one of those um, entries into into midlife. I've kind of always wanted a kind of a quiet life. You know what I mean? Which middle age insists that you have <laughs> because you're <laughs> yeah. so tired all the time <laughs> so i'm kind of i'm kind but of you say that it. though but you put yourself under incredible performance pressure i mean i've seen your one man shows mm-hmm. you know and and grief is a thing with feathers which i was lucky enough to see the last time yeah like and and you did a run of that and then you did it again yeah. and you did it all over the world yeah if anyone witnesses one of your stage shows they go wow mm. actually I didn't know any human could perform for that long, you know, with such high intensity, you know, so you say you're knackered, but, you know, you're, you're still Mm. your output of intensity and performances is actually higher than it's ever been. Yeah, well, that was a sort of a, I think, thanks what is for for what you said about the play? The play was it was a real joy doing that play it, but it did, uh, it did wear me out. And I think that was probably a, uh, a sort of a revelation in terms of like, okay, maybe, you know, I, what I do think is your body talks to you a bit more when you're 43, right? Your body goes, do you really want to do that? Do you really want to do that? And then you have to listen to it and go, maybe I don't want to do that. I do want to break dance at this wedding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's why we drink, to shut it up. <laughs> well, that's, and I think, I hope that maybe I listen to listen listen to my body a little bit more mm. because it it sometimes it speaks more sense than your head, you know. And so I so in, in answer to your question, I probably won't be doing theater to that intensity in a while. Do you know? More movies then? I have no idea. I have no idea. Like, is there anything you really want to do? You um, know, I I know we've spoken. There's been rumors about Peaky the film as, oh, yeah. a, as a project. That's something you are on record interested in doing, aren't you? Yeah, f- yeah. I mean, it's as all long hy- as the writing is exactly. Yeah, it's all hypothetical. Do you know what I mean? But like, it's it- Peaky the musical. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> there's there's talk of that. You know, but um, I'm really happy doing the show. I think we've um, done something so far, which is I've not seen done before, which is that each series becomes deeper and richer and mm. sort of is um uh, moves the dial in that with that that stupid phrase but you know what i mean every yeah. every every phrase every um series does that so uh if we can keep on doing that i'm happy out you know? 
But is there anything, any kind of movie or any kind of person or people that you want to work with or go, you know, if I had to quit next year, mm. I want to work with this guy or I'd like a crack at that? Or Yeah, I, I've stopped kind of naming people or doing lists because it only ends up in disappointment, really. <laughs> <because> you <laughs> never work with them. And hopefully, I've all, what I figured out is that if you do good work, then the people you admire might call you up. You know. There's a lot of Irish involvement in this season in particular. There mm-hmm. has been throughout the series. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us about that and who's who you've enjoyed hooking up with. Well, last last uh, last series, series four, was directed by David Caffrey. This series is directed by Anthony Byrne. So we've had two Irish directors in a row, and uh, this year we have uh, Brian Gleeson is joining the cast, and we also have. Is in, in, Brian is, is he's Brendan Gleeson's son. Yes. Uh, yes. Obviously, people tend to know Donald a bit more because he's been in Star Wars and, and big stuff like that. Yeah, Brian is a wonderful actor, a brilliant actor, part of the Gleeson dynasty. Mm. And uh, Charlie Murphy and Aidan Gillen and Ned Dennehy. I'm trying to just, by the end of it, I, I want the whole thing. To, <laughs> <laughs> just to be Irish people. Everyone to be Irish. Why do you think there is so much Irish involvement? Well, I think it started off uh, at the beginning because, like, 1918, it was set in. So, you know, again, when he, the way he works in history to the show, yeah. that it would make sense that you would have the Irish question, as it was called then in Britain, that that would be part of the story or the, uh, the backdrop historically. Mm. And so then I think uh, Stephen Knight just really likes Irish actors as well. And... Uh, um, and then it just it kept popping up. Some of the, some of the Irish actors in aren't playing Irish. Um, yeah, um, but they just happen to be great actors, and we're very. Is, that, is that nice for you when you're on set with a few more Irish heads? It is actually. Gotta say, yeah. it is because we have a good laugh, and um, like some of them I wouldn't have known before. Like I wouldn't have known Aidan Gillen, or I wouldn't have known Breen really, other than to say hello. So you get to know them, and you know it's just the. Uh, the crack like you, you you just have more of a laugh easier mm. quicker is it a laugh on set do you have I mean, a good crack or is it all, is it all hard work it's hard work but you have to have a laugh and particularly like when the subject is a little bit grim and to, you know tommy tommy you don't get much laughs out of tommy as a character <laughs> uh you know i i don't um he's not that sort of character so so but yeah you gotta have a laugh when you're when you're yeah, because I saw some nice photos of you on set where you're talking to Tom Hardy and both of you are cracking up laughing, but your face is covered in blood. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a lot of that yeah. sort of uh, uh, messing. I think if you don't have bring some sort of levity into it when everything is quite heavy, you, you mm. could go um, a, a little bit, you know, it could get to you a little bit. One of the things about the show is that really hits home for people Mm. it's the music Mm -hmm. and it's that meshing of you know an old backdrop Mm. to really powerful music from far more recent times yeah you know particularly nick cave and yeah um and certainly the season the the episode i saw of the new season doesn't disappoint there's a brilliant moment where you see the outside of westminster and a really iconic tune which i won't mm. give away yeah. kicks in yeah and it just it almost announces thomas shelby's here yeah you know watch out but yeah. that meshing of music how much i'm always wondering how much input do you have if any with the tunes because you do have a producer's role now and does that allow you to kind of fiddle around in those areas well at the beginning the whole sort of conceptually how that came about was the the director of the first uh three episodes uh otto bathurst that was his idea the whole idea of putting contemporary music to a period piece and he and and nick cave kind of became like the artist or kind of yardstick and he be kind of that that tune obviously then became kind of our theme tune and it was the atmosphere of that tune um, that are the energy of that tune that we, kind of all the other music in the show has to kind of live up to, I, I think. Um, and so since then, it's expanded and grown and evolved. Um, and we've had amazing bands and artists on it. And, I, and this year, um, it's expanded again. And we've got this amazing um, 
artist Anna Calvi, who's doing the score, uh, and some of her original tunes are on it as well. And uh, we have like uh, Black Sabbath around it, which seemed obvious. Yeah, <laughs> like why are Black Sabbath not not on the show prior to this? And uh, who else? Um, I think uh, Radiohead are back on it again. Um, and are modern acts chuffed when you know when they find out, or is it all just cold record companies signing contracts? Do the acts themselves get a buzz out of being on Peaky Blinders? The musicians that I've met, uh, whose music have been has been on it, have have always enjoyed it. Uh, and um, like who? I'm not going to name drop here. But <laughs> Come on, I've no just, way. I've just given you ample opportunity. <laughs> all of the... All well, of yeah, I know you are a Radiohead fan. So yeah. has Tom York managed to... Has he gone... I th- uh, I, 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 like, you know, you wouldn't get Radiohead music uh, for the show unless they were fans of the show. I yeah. Think. I think that's pretty clear because they don't have to give their music to any, you know, to any show. Mm. And they're they've obviously for years been so choosy about how their music is used commercially. Yeah, they're probably um, the choosiest of the choosy, yeah, in fairness, exactly. aren't they? Yeah, and it's served them so brilliantly. Yeah. So when a, when a piece, of ra- a piece of Radiohead music appears in a show or a film, it really, you know, uh, it'll have been chosen, you know, perfectly. And also those lads will have watched it and gone, yes. You know, and, and in fact, all of the artists will have watched it and gone, yes. But... um. And what about Nick Cave himself? Because he probably features heavier than everybody else. Yeah. He, well, I mean, did you that, get to have a chat with him? I have met him, and I and uh, we've sort of joked about it. You know what I mean? Um, but but I hope that if it's been a sort of a, a way that has inter- way that people have discovered Nick Cave's music, then that's wonderful from my point of view because he's one of my favorite artists. And if and if people through watching Peaky Blinders have have. Um, started to listen to Nick Cave and that's only a good thing you know yeah yeah because you are a musician you well, love music it is important to you mm. and now you've taken my job <laughs> and except you've just gone straight to BBC primetime and gone hi I love my own radio show people might know that on this side of the IRC that you have been working as a as a radio presenter and music cur- curator on your own show over there well, Six Music, um, BBC Six Music, which is one of my favourite radio stations um, after Today FM. Um, nice, nice. <laughs> good save. See the way I did that? <laughs> um, I, uh, I listen to it all the time and um, Guy Garvey has a brilliant show from two to four and he went off to to perform and record with Elbow. So they, they asked me would I come in and just deputise him for a few weeks. And I did, and I absolutely adored it. But he made the fatal error of letting you in, <laughs> deputise. <laughs> Don't and worry. And now the deputy's becoming the sheriff. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No way. No, he, he'll be back very shortly. And uh, I, like, I've listened to his show for 10 years, and Shazam, it's like Shazam to so many songs <laughs> off, off, that, uh, off that show. And, and he's a gentleman. Do you ever think of getting your own music onto the next project you're doing i know because you've done it in the past i remember wasn't it disco pigs uh, yeah but you i know it's a while ago but you had your own tune is on that soundtrack if people mm. want to go back and listen to it and you know you were famously in a band mr mm. green jeans and you made that choice a long time ago to go down the acting rather than yeah then follow the the record label deal which you were offered is it something because you're so passionate about it are, now that you are in producer land yeah. and you know when you have a bit more of swagger around the halls of of film industry is that something that you would think maybe of going actually maybe now is the right time to to blend never no 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 no. i mean i i I think i realized a long time ago that whatever abilities that i may have as a musician which are now dormant because i haven't picked up a guitar in years like uh couldn't hold a candle to the sort of musicians that i adore and respect and um also i've kind of i'm a little bit like just do one thing well that's how i am yeah i'm a little bit uh, like that which is perhaps self-limiting but it's the way it works for me it's funny when i was telling people that i was coming to just my my team and work was saying i'm coming out to to chat to you uh they wanted to know was there anything that you do that people may not know you do you know my big passions really are music and books that really you know they're the two things that keep me going 
when I'm working and uh, it keep me interested when I'm not working, uh, really. Mm. Um, and and they've is it been, fiction? Do you read fiction? Or? Yeah, pretty much mostly fiction, really. Well, the, the bookites will want to know who you're reading at the moment then. Who am I reading at the moment? Oh, or what have you enjoyed? There um, is actually an open book on the coffee table here. <laughs> How <it>. pretentious, girl. <laughs> No, this is actually what I mean. Freud. <laughs> this is uh, Jonathan Lethem, and uh, it's a, it's some some of his essays. But it's actually very interesting. It's called the Ecstasy of Influence, and it's about you know people that have influenced him over the years. People like Dylan and Brando, and people like that. And I'm very interested about that. You know, the way you can read a book or see a film when you're 15, mm. and it's life changing. And you can set you on a path that you'll be on for the rest of your life, trying to emulate it or um, figure out how they did it. Or you know, so, so I'm interested in that stuff. Was there a book or a film, say you're mentioning, like at that age, that stuck with you? Yeah, I mean, I, I've talked about this before. There was a film called Scarecrow, which I saw by accident with my brother, um, with Gene Hackman and Al Pacino. Um, I, but I saw that when I was about sixteen. But I didn't. Um, didn't make me want to be an actor, but it, it still remained my favorite film of all time. And then you ended up being scared. Of <laughs> 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 I've loved that. Enjoyed that movie. I'm going to become a scarecrow in a Batman film. So you didn't see Jaws, and you're like, I'm now a dentist. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Killian. I think we've gone lots of wonderful places. Uh, yeah. We wish you the very best of luck with uh, season five of Peaky Blinders. Thank you. Um, we can't wait to see the new film that you're working on now. Brilliant. Um, well, it was great to chat to you as always. Dermot and Dave's Peaky Blinders special. Exclusive interview with Killian Murphy. On Today FM.